Okay, great. We'll give everyone one more minute. Um, we're putting names, brands in the chat to just get things going. Um, you can also talk about where you're from. I'm in Chicago right now. Apologies if you hear my new puppy. He's being a little bit of a bad boy, but you know, I love him still. <laughs> Okay, so it's four. So let's just let's just get started. Um, so uh, hi, I'm Candice. I am the data genius, but I, al I also own a brand called Geem. Um, and you know what what that gives me a unique perspective is kind of both sides of the thing. Of I know how hard it is to be a brand, and you know want, needing to convince retailers, and you know convincing them, especially if you're in a new category. Um, and so that's where the partner with Nielsen IQ can come really in handy because um, what is more convincing than data um, and it'll be a nice addition to kind of the storytelling piece of your story um, but yeah no um, I, I encourage everyone if they haven't already to check out startupcpg.com and join the slack we have about 15,000 members we're very active I can kind of tell you as a brand how much time and energy it saved me being a solo founder is lonely so I love the startup CPG family um, and weekly I do data drops so if you come into the call and you're like I can't get enough Go to the Startup CPG Slack and look at my data drops. I post one every week. Um, but yeah, we're so excited to have Jordan here from Nielsen IQ. Uh, Jordan, why don't you give a little bit of an intro to yourself um, and then we can get started. Perfect. Hi, everyone. I see Margo just joined too. Margo, I have a feeling we're going to see a lot of new Margos running around given the Barbie movie just coming out. I think that name will blow up. Um, for a quick introduction, I'm Jordan. I've been with Nielsen for five years as of yesterday, actually. In those five years, I spent three years working exclusively with emerging brands. So spent two years with emerging brands then worked on the retailer side, so working with Whole Foods and Walmart to see what data do you want brands bringing to you. Was, again, was there for about two years and then ran back to the emerging brand side to take that knowledge I learned to some of these growing brands um, to help them grow at retailers like Whole Foods, like Walmart, and help get their foot in the door. So really passionate about helping growing brands take over some shelf space start to win at retail uh, and then get into the data like candace said i think data is one of those things that can be so scary when it's abstract in your mind but when you actually start looking at it it's really not so nielsen's worked very hard to democratize data make it as easy as possible to use so that emerging brands do have a chance when they're up against some of their larger competition. So the goal of today is we're going to go over what should your retailer pitch look like? What do you need to bring to them? So this conversation is assuming you already have your foot in the door. You've worked to get that meeting on the calendar. You have some FaceTime or Zoom time with a retailer. I know there's a big a mix of both, depending on which retailer you're working with right now. What should that presentation then look like? And how do you move your goal forward? Whether that goal is to just get on the shelf in the first place, gain some distribution, um, get some more competitive promotions, whatever that goal might be, what should that presentation look like to make that happen? So there's three main things to, to think of, or I guess I'll say common mistakes that I don't see happening when brands are looking to get on shelf. And I'll also pause to say thank you for using the chat, Elizabeth. Thanks for joining. Please put questions into the chat box and then Candice will help alert me when one comes through um, and we'll be sure to answer it. So keep this interactive. Let us know what questions you have. Um, this is definitely a safe space. No question is too big or too small. I was once asked who Sam is as when I was speaking about Sam's Club. So truly, every question is fair. Um, so some common mistakes is when some of our more emerging brands are going to retailer, retailers, they're telling 
their story of why they should be on shelf in relation to them. And it's kind of like a, a first date where if you're talking about yourself the whole time, you're probably not going to get a second date. The person wants to know, how are you going to fit into my life too? What do you know about me? What do you know about how we're doing and our goals? And how are you going to help me? So you want to be bringing in your passion, definitely, and your story. But bring in your passion and your story in the lens that the retailer is going to want it. So show that you know something about their category. Show that you have their logo on your deck rather than their competition's logo. Show that you know a little bit about their competition too. You probably know your competitive space inside and out, but what's your retailer's competitive space? What are they up against? What are some of those macro trends going on in the retailer arena? So talking to the retailer through the eyes of the retailer and what they care about. And I will give you the cheat code here. What they care about is making money. So you're going to want to bring your passion again to show why there's a need for your product, how it's going to benefit their shopper, their space. And then in addition to your passion, back that passion and that story with data, with numbers to prove out how you're actually going to benefit the retailer and benefit their pocket. So that's one of the big things is know your retailer, speak to your retailer in the lens that they'll want to hear it, which generally is going to be financial. But then sometimes it might have additional things layered in, like sustainability, like understanding the retailer might have a really big gluten-free or vegan shopper, uh, understanding some of their needs there and the marketplace. The next thing is going to be when you're talking to the retailer, you might have 20 years of experience in the category you're talking about. But I think like a first date, not coming in as the know-it-all, like, you know, everything going on in the space, you're coming in telling them how it is, making it more of a back and forth and interactive conversation. So not saying, you know, not coming in and saying, hey, retailer, you're doing it all wrong. You have this categorization wrong, shelf space wrong. You're doing promotions wrong. My product can fix all that. Having it more of a conversation where, you know, I see you're doing this, this, and this really well. What I might suggest is X, Y, and Z, or where my brand could possibly fill a void is here. So that's another one. It's just kind of using some of those people skills in your conversations with your retailer. The next thing to consider is that when you're going into a retailer, every spot on that shelf is currently filled. So you need to create a story that tells why your product should take something off, something else off the shelf. This is another case where your passion and your story will get you some of the way there, but you really need data to get you the rest of the way. So you can say, yep, there's a gap in sustainability in the coffee market, uh, just making something up. My product is completely sustainable. Uh, we know shoppers want it because my next door neighbor told me everyone in our community loves it from what I'm hearing on the street. That's great. But then actually having the numbers to back it is what's going to convince the retailer. I'm Candace, curious to hear your thoughts and how your experience getting your product on shelf and having some of these conversations aligns with some of those points. Yeah, no, absolutely. Shelf, the reality is shelf space is so expensive and especially like they, I think retailers love startup brands because it brings an incentive for people to come in and there's new things, but it's risky. Um, so I think they want to see kind of like an established 
established story of like, okay, maybe if it's not your product that, you know, you're pulling data from maybe products in a similar category and why should they take someone out? Um, the, one of the best advice I got was like, what's the swappable thing that you could swap with, um, especially for a product like mine, like seaweed snacks. They're like, oh, there's not like an existing seaweed snack they can swap out with. What's an existing snack? And for me, it was like a vegetable chip. Um, and so like proving out that like, you know, your velocities might be better than a, an adjacent category is a really strong story too. Um, I have a question for you, Jordan. Also, um, if everyone, anyone has, yes, the recording will be shared. Um, but yes, um, I think that uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put it in the webinar and I can help facilitate. I can start us off with a question. Um, so uh, Jordan, you mentioned that, you know, you know, um, when you present these decks to retailers, you should kind of have it more be a conversation. Would you recommend longer or shorter decks? So generally shorter, um, and it's going to depend a bit on the nature of the meeting, so how much time you have too. But generally, I would recommend not overpacking it. The way that I would think about it if I were you is if you're getting this presentation, how are you going to feel? Does this data feel overwhelming to you? Does it feel like it's too much information to you? If you feel overwhelmed by it, or let's say you're talking to a high school student and they might feel overwhelmed by it, chances are the buyer's going to as well and zone out a little bit. So generally, you'd want to ask for your buyer strategy ahead of time. What are some of their key goals? What are they looking to see so that you know how to tailor your presentation? And then you probably want to have a couple of slides on how you're going to help that strategy. Again, in addition to your, your passion, your brand, your brand story, and then backing that with data too. Super helpful. So awesome. A next follow-up we frequently get when we're talking about data, building in your data story or making your deck is, okay, great. I understand I should have data, but where do I get this data? What does this data look like? Um, something I'd compare this to is I think we all hear, you know, you should be investing, you should be investing. And it's like, okay, but what does that mean? What do I invest in? Where do I do it? Um, that's really the same thing with data is it can feel a little overwhelming, but then when you start learning about it, it's super simple and you realize, shoot, I wish I was doing this a lot earlier. And so I'm going to screen share here and show you our platform visor and what Visor is, is going to be the platform where you actually pull the data, build the DACs from. And it's a platform that Nielsen made about three years ago. And the reason that we made it is because we saw a gap in the market that actually was emerging brands. So when I started at Nielsen, again, five years ago, when emer an emerging brand had a data question, we were delivering them Excel reports, generally about monthly. And often the client was calling us and saying, hey, like my grandpa just agreed to finance me $3,000. What can I get with this for data? Um, maybe they're doing a grassroots funding where they were able to raise a little bit of money here or there, a couple hundred or thousand dollars. And we're trying to figure out what they can get for it. At that time, the only thing they could get in their price range was those Excel reports. That generally wasn't enough to be competing with the P&Gs, the Unilevers, the crafts of the world. So Nielsen thought, how can we help these emerging brands compete on shelf more at an affordable price? And the answer to that was our Visor platform, which is what you're looking at now. So Visor is jam packed with all of the resources that these larger brands have, but they're built in a more digestible way. So Visor is using a lot of AI to pre-format reports, actually pre-make decks so that when you don't have a team of data experts like Candice or Kraft has, you are able to still get a very similar result because of all the functionality built into the Visor tool. 
So the first thing that I'm going to show here is going to be our stories functionality. And what stories is, is it truly answers the question of, okay, I know I need to have data, but what does that actually mean? Where do I actually get it? I know it's something I should be doing, but I don't even know where to start. And also, I'm one person doing 10 jobs, which we frequently find with our emerging brands. So I don't have a lot of time to be spending on this either. Then that's where stories comes in. So what stories does is builds you an entire deck. So you can see here we have category review decks, category management decks, shopper snapshots. So who actually is your shopper, brand reviews, pricing and promotion, a number of different pre-made decks that will use AI to populate your information into them so that your staff can download it, bring it, add your passion and your story to it, and then bring it to your retailer, everything you need. So the one I'm going to walk today is going to be brand review. Brand review is going to assess your competition. So when you look at your category, who are you competing against and how are you doing against them? Understand your shopper trends. So who is your shopper? Who's your competition shopper? What are they spending? Where do they live? Uh, just some more information about them. How old are they? Performance drivers. So what is driving your success? Is that your price point? Uh, is it that you added a new item? Are you doing promotions that are really successful? Your performance against the category and then any pricing and promotion information. So we click this, we want to see all of that. We'll go to next steps. You can see a preview there of what the report's actually going to look like. And then you're going to select some metrics you want to see. So let's select our focus brand here. I'm going to be pulling private label today and also manifesting my fictional company called Jordan Beverage Brands, which is a coffee company. And we special specialize in vanilla, French vanilla coffee. So we're going to look at coffee today because I'm curious to see how is private label doing in the coffee segment. Um, we're, you could rename your brand to Jordan's Coffee. We'll leave it private label for today. Then we're going to choose our market. So where do we actually want to be looking at? Which in Pfizer, you're actually able to see almost every market that Nielsen has access to. So you can get down to retailer level, state line, um, pull down a little bit more granular. Let's see, I might need to refresh here. I pre-pulled these a while ago, so sometimes it yeah, no worries. And just a reminder to everyone, uh, we from Startup CPG have three free advisor reports. So um, listen very closely. I definitely get a lot of requests, but I can't do them all for my data drop. So this is a very good way to get data quickly. Great point. So let's say you're going to Expo East in a couple weeks here, and you're really looking to meet with a specific retailer. What you could do is pick your category up top, pick your brand, then you'll go into your geography here, your geography or a specific retailer you want to see. So I am in the land of Publix. So I'm going to click on grocery, scroll down to Publix. And then if I wanted to, I'll just look at total Publix for today. But I wanted to, I could get even more granular to look at regions. So maybe I want to see Publix Miami um, get a little bit more granular. Click next. I want to compare it to major markets. So I want to see all FMCG. So I'm going to compare how I'm doing in Publix versus how I'm doing in essentially the total United States. Then look at time here. Grab is 52. We'll see I'm doing on a year basis, but you can get down to four weeks if you're newer and want to see how you go over a week. And then we'll click next. So what we pulled there is going to be our product. So what's our brand, our market, 
What retailer or area do we want to see? Our time periods. So what time frame is it? Latest four weeks, latest 13, or latest 52? And that's all you need to select to generate yourself a report. So as you can see, the brand poll is pulling right now, aggregating all that data up so that we can see how the coffee category is doing. If you wanted to get a little bit more granular, again, like I mentioned, I am, my fictional coffee brand is focused specifically in the French vanilla space. So I could pull specifically how I'm doing by flavor in French vanilla, for example. You can look at sizes, flavor, um, get into subcategory, a number of different a number of different variations you can break it up into to make that subset a little bit smaller. Um, and while we pull the story, while we let it load, I actually pre-pulled it here so that we can see what it looks like. And I'll let you know that this poll, aside from editing private label to say Jordan Coffee brand, I didn't do any other modifications on this. This report is exactly as it pulled out. So it takes anywhere from about two minutes to 20 minutes to pull a story. And it generates what would take about three to five days in an analyst time to pull a deck together. Um, so we'll walk through that, but no, it's incredibly, incredibly quick. I will caveat sometimes, depending on the name of your brand, you might need to go through and reformat a couple things. For example, if your brand is very long, maybe make the font a little bit smaller. But other than that, you have a pre-made deck. All of your data is in um, and you'll be all set. So again, you just need to add your story. I will walk through a couple of the slides here, but you can see what this story is going to do is walk you through each of the different things we previously said. So go over your category, your shopper trends, what's driving performance, um, how's your brand performing versus the category, and then any price and promotion details. So if we look at this overview slide, let's say I'm Jordan Coffee. I'm talking to Publix. I got my big break here with a meeting with them. One of the first things that I'm going to highlight is this slide number four and say, if we look at the total coffee category here, which is going to say, which is growing at 10.4% in the latest 13 weeks, my brand, Jordan's Coffee brand, is it actually growing at almost 18%. So my brand is growing about 8% faster than the total category. If I'm a buyer and I'm seeing this, I'm thinking, great, that's making me money. I'm starting to think in my mind, what are some of those lower performing brands that I can take off the shelf to add Jordan's Coffee onto? Hey, Jordan, sorry, um, quick technology glitch. Would you mind resharing your screen? I think the screen they said is frozen or maybe it, the data's on oh. another, yeah. <laughs> yes, that's probably it. Great call out, thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. That means everyone's paying attention, that's good. <laughs> All right, here we go, share. Are you able to see PowerPoint now? Oh, yes. Now we have PowerPoint. Great. Perfect. So I'll start a little bit from the beginning. So this full deck is exactly what we just pulled out of Pfizer, the platform you were stuck looking at. And the PowerPoint is, again, what it generated. So if I go down to slide four here, you can see that the coffee category is up 10.4% first year ago. Whereas my coffee brand, Jordan's Coffee Company, is up almost 18%. So really compelling story to tell your buyer. Something that I see frequently that emerging brands assume, but isn't necessarily true, is that the buyer or the retailer knows the ins and outs of every brand and what's happening at the category and what's on the horizon. When the reality is probably much like each of you on the call, maybe feeling a little bit overworked, like you're doing 12 jobs. Sometimes the buyer feels that way too. They have a lot on their plate. 
Sometimes they're managing multiple categories, um, looking at what's generating revenue, working with multiple different brands, working with out of stocks. They have so much going on that they frequently don't have the time to look into all of the data with their category, what's doing well, what's not, what promotions are working, what aren't, um, really looking into that. So bringing this data to them is a big benefit and it's not something that they generally know. If you're not telling your story, chances are nobody is. So it really is important to be bringing this data to them. Great. Um, I see a couple of questions yes. in the chat. So let me let me moderate. Um, <laughs> so uh, we have a question from Barb and a very related question from Sasha. Um, so let's say you're super small, like me. I'm super small, and you know you're not really sure if you'll you'll show up in Nielsen. Um, so one of the questions is, will it allow you to look up category data if you don't have SKUs on the market? Or if you're in a, let's say, so I'm in independent shops and a lot of times independent shops aren't really recognized in Nielsen immediately. Yeah, so with the independent shops, great call out. Sometimes we don't pick up independent data. So that might take a little bit of time for your data to start showing in Nielsen. But what we have brands doing in that case is looking at the total category to show how the category is doing versus how you know your brand is doing in those independent shops. Um, I also see a question on how many stores do you need to be in for this to work? If you're in one store that we track, your data will start populating. The only caveat there is that you do need to get your items submitted to Nielsen so that we're tracking them. There's two ways we start tracking items. One is that they hit a sales threshold that we recognize, okay, this is a real product. It's not just a random scan a cashier typed in. This is something we should be tracking. And then the second way, which is what I always recommend for more emerging brands, is that you submit them to us. So what you would do is just reach out to Nielsen and we will leave a, one, we'll leave a scan and two, I'll share my email right in the chat so you have it. You reach out to Nielsen and say, hey, we have these items. We need to get them in the system. Start tracking them because you told us to. Uh, so it out on um, is really just letting us know they're selling. Again, only caveat there is going to be if you're in some of those smaller stores. Let's see, am I frozen or is Candace frozen? I think you're back. So I think your screen is frozen, um, but you might be back. Are you are you there? Yes, I'm there. Where did you lose me? Okay. I think we got everything you said. It just sped you up a little bit. Um, <laughs> okay, great. Um, I have another question from Rich. Um, I know typically with Nielsen, there's a little bit of a lag of when it gets into the system. Do you have an estimate or does it vary from kind of like retailer SKUs, et cetera? Yeah. So once the retailer, once we essentially close the week, it's generally a nine day lag. This question could be in regards to having your specific items in the system, in which case it's just getting them coded with your Nielsen representative. Got it. To reach yep. out, getting the items in. And then the lag, the, that nine day lag of when the, the books essentially close, the retailer tells us this is every item that sold and we input it into Nielsen. I'll be honest, I'm not a product expert, but what I imagine there is that it is such a mass amount of data. Sometimes I think about the amount that Nielsen tracks and how much Nielsen does. It's looking at the demographics of people who, who are buying each item. It's looking at every item that's scanned across the register. Was it on promotion? Was it not? Uh, the amount of data that Nielsen works with takes a bit of, it's just so much that it does take a bit of time to get aggregated, sorted, and uploaded correctly. So 
I'm not a data, I'm not, I am a data expert. I am not a product expert. I don't know all that goes into the back end, but I would imagine it's just the sheer volume that causes a little bit of a delay. Um, Correct. Um, and I think when you were halfway frozen, let, it was kind of like unclear. So just to remind everyone, how do we get in touch with Nielsen about making sure that the products are accurately tagged and submitted? Great question. So we'll put my email up on the screen and then we also can either, we'll see if Aless can get it now, um, our marketing team is on the call, if they can put our coding email into the chat. And if they can't, what we can do is follow up with the recording and then also the email to reach out to to get your products coded. Um, another way you can ensure that they're in is at the end of this call, we'll have up a QR code for you to get your free, your three free Nielsen reports. We really should have made it two free or four free just because it's <laughs> three free Nielsen reports. Um, and when you scan that QR code, you'll get in touch with a Nielsen representative who will be able to help get your products coded as well. Really good question. Great. I see one more. Is data available for countries outside of the US? Yes, there is. Um, and a fun Nielsen tidbit or trivia fact is depending on what market you're looking at, so whereas with the U.S., there's items that just scan across the register, we get the data. In some countries we work with where the technology isn't quite where the U.S. is yet, we actually have Nielsen team members who go through, go through panelists who agree to, agree to this trash to actually write down everything they bought, the volume, the UPC, et cetera, et cetera, um, to figure out everything that was purchased. So we do have data in other countries. I know you specifically asked about Mexico. That one isn't the trash collection method. Um, but yes, we do have data for different countries, which if again, if you scan that QR code, you can get in touch with the Nielsen representative who can help you get that. Perfect, these are all awesome questions. So moving along, I'm going to go into slide 10 here, which is going to show you a little bit more information on some pricing strategy. So I can see here, Jordan's base, Jordan's coffee base price is at $3.52, whereas the average for my category is actually $3.99. So one, this is telling a story to the retailer of, hey, this is a more low cost item to bring onto your shelf. But two, this is telling me maybe I can raise my costs a little bit. Um, I know some more emerging brands to get a pulse check on pricing in their category are actually going to a couple different retailers to see what the set looks like. That takes much more time than just pulling a number out of Pfizer here. So quick way to get a pulse check on your pricing versus your competitions. Um, you actually can pull your competition's pricing down at an item level within Visor as well. This deck is just giving you a, an overview. Next, I'm going to move along a little bit here to slide 15. I think this was a really valuable slide for our more emerging brands to show how loyal consumers are. So loyalty is a great metric to pull out when you are growing. And also when your sales might not tell the story that you're wanting them to. So you can show, for example, sure, maybe my sale, maybe Jordan's sales are down a bit versus a year ago, but we can see that our shoppers are so loyal to my brand that if I'm not on the shelf, they might go to your competition to pick up the product. I know this is what I do with my L'Oreal mascara. I have been a Die hard L'Oreal mascara fan since I was probably 16. And if it is not at the shelf, I am walking out of that store and I'm picking it up somewhere it is. I won't product swap. I won't try a different mascara. I'm going to go to a retailer that has the one I want. 
I also am a sucker for whatever is in the checkout lines. I'm always picking up a gum, a chapstick, maybe hair ties, whatever it is they're promoting to me in those checkout lines while I wait. So not only is the retailer who doesn't have my mascara on shelf missing out on my $11 mascara purchase, they're also missing out on the probably $15 to $16 in extra items I'm picking up because I walked out of their store and walked into a store with the product I want. So just because sales are declining or maybe aren't as strong as your competition, that doesn't always mean that you shouldn't be on shelf. And this is another example of a story that your buyer probably isn't looking into. Whereas I have Jordan's coffee at my heart, the center of every day that I'm thinking about, I know the ins and outs of, my buyer doesn't. They don't care who they have on the shelf generally. They care what's making them money. So it's up to you to tell your story and bring in things, data points like loyalty, like your repeat shoppers, people who are trying it and buying it again. Um, there's another metric that maybe, maybe you don't have as many shoppers yet because you're newer in this space, but you do know that your trial and repeat score is really, really high. So anyone who tries your product is buying it again and again and again, and you get really loyal customers. As I'm going over this again, kind of just demystifying data, things like trial and repeat, two-time buyers can sound so complicated, but when you start looking into it, you start talking about it, it really is incredibly simple. A two-time buyer, someone who buys your product twice. A loyal buyer is somebody who's loyal to your product, leaving the store to get it somewhere else if they don't have it. Um, so it's really one of those things that once you start looking into, it's incredibly simple. Um, I'll also call out that if you ever do have a question, Visor was made completely for emerging brands who might still be everywhere from in their parents' basement, just starting up their product, all the way to being able to hire analysts who used to work at P&G or Kraft. So it is built for a wide variety of skill set and experience level. And if you are more at the beginning here, we have the support for it. So one, you can hover over, and I'll go back into Visor in a minute here, but you can hover over each metric, each report, you can see templates to see what each one means in layman's terms. But then if you need a little bit more support, we have a team of three who mans, or I guess I should say women's our Pfizer support chat of three incredible ladies who you can message at any time during working hours to get a response. And it is a human being there responding to you and helping get you an answer. Uh, so the support is really limitless within the Visor platform. Uh, and again, completely there to answer questions as beginner as who is Sam's in regards to Sam's Club. That's great. Um, I love that you're doing this for small brands because I remember at Big CBG, we had like raw data pools, which were very accessible compared to, you know, other industries. But, you know, I'm so glad that the Visor platform, you know, just makes it so easy for emerging brands. Um, and I think, you know, your presentation really answered uh, Tim's question, actually, of, you know, if you're already at retailers, like, how would you negotiate for better placements? And I think the report you just showed about the um, loyalty really, really could help. Definitely. That and then bringing in some of your loyalty and then bringing in some of your success stories. So showing, hey, look, you know, we're all the way on the bottom of the shelf right now and you can't really see us, but we're moving, we're still moving a lot faster than brands who have the prime spot. So imagine if we had the prime spot, how much quickly we could be moving, how much more revenue we could be generating you. So building that story and telling it. And um, this can happen in a number of different ways too. So maybe it is as cut and dry as your velocity is moving a lot quicker than the brand who has the shelf space you want or the space you want, or it is showing loyalty, like Candace said, 
um, maybe the brand or maybe the spot you want, the current person in it has three or four flavors. Maybe it's telling the story of there's cannibalization here. If you bring in our product, we'll be reaching an entire new demographic. Um, so it's really telling that data story of why you deserve that shelf space over the person who is there. I'd say too, when you are on shelf, that's a really good question to use those three reports for, three free reports you get for joining this uh, webinar and work with your Nielsen representative to talk through what the best reports are to tell that story for you. So maybe it's getting into some health and wellness characteristics. Um, maybe everyone in the shelf set you want isn't a better for you item and you are a better for you product. So it would bring in a whole new shopper. It's really figuring out what is special about your brand and goes back to your passion, your story, and then putting the data behind it, finding what those data points are to tell that story. Really good question. So the stories that we just walked through, that pre-made deck is awesome for when you have a meeting coming up to get some, to get an entire deck made. But let's say you want to do a more unique poll. You want something a little bit more generic or less generic, I guess, like finding the better for you characteristic, sustainability, flavors, et cetera, or just a quick weekly overview. Um, a lot of our teams have their analysts or their marketing team pulling out the stories, but then often the C-suite, for example, will be coming in weekly or monthly just to get a check on the brand ranking, which we can click through. How's the brand doing? How's the category doing? Um, so I'll click into brand ranking here. How are we doing on time again this we're doing really good. And we have some questions that we can answer at the end. So I think we're doing really well. Perfect. Okay, so for our brand ranking, I'm going to pull in private label again. We'll stick with coffee here. And almost every report is going to pull those same three things. Your product, which is generally going to be your brand or your category, your time periods, and your markets. That's it. That's all you need to know in order to pull data. So really demystifying. It's scary. If you know the product you want to look at, which again, generally your brand or your category, the market, which is generally going to be either the retailer or the state you want to see. And then your time period, you know, everything you need to, to be a data wizard. So today we're going to look at coffee. Characteristic here, I could pull in, for example, caffeine count, Claim, this is going to be like organic, better for you, etc. cetera. Um, flavor, so for me, it would be French vanilla. I'm just going to look at total coffee right now for private label. I next can pull in my market. So again, I could look at Publix again, but instead I'm just going to look at total US. So pull in each, each time period. I'm going to pull in 52 weeks but I do want to call out that you can get down to one week here. And I'll also note that getting almost every market that Nielsen has at a weekly time period prior to Bizer started in the six figures and up. Um, so there was really no competitive option to get this level of former brands before Bizer. Um, which now is at a much more emerging brand price point. Uh, so while this polls, any questions right now in the chat box to talk through? Um, I think we might have already answered this question, but there was an earlier question of like, you know, if I just wanted to look at the category level and I don't have a focus brand, can we do that? And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, when you're doing the drop down, that was an optional for the company for the, for the focus brand. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you can look at just the category. Uh, you can look at 
just how the category, a really cool category review to do. And when you're looking at places to target, trying to see which retailer should I get into to talk to, a category review is a great place to start. So pulling category and then looking at category at some of your target retailers. So trying to see how the competition is doing at each retailer, uh, digging into maybe one of the retailers is down versus us in the category and you know that in the change they're in you're really growing so telling them that story of hey you know i I see sales are down right now for the coffee category we're growing on average at 18 percent first year ago so if you add me to the shelf i probably can help turn that story around which is an example we see a bit here So if we're looking at coffee right now for private label, we can see that it is a $12 billion industry. It's up 7% versus a year ago. Uh, You can see that sales are down. So this is a really interesting story because sales are up, units are down. Obviously means that price points have gone up. So people are willing to pay more for their coffee and they're buying a little bit less. Um, Velocity is also up moving pretty quick. And then price point is also up 10% versus year ago, which which makes total sense based on what we're seeing there. So this is a really good story, a really good report to run if you are trying to get on shelf, figure out who your competition is and how you're doing against them. So if I'm, say, Collectivo Coffee here, I'm growing at 61% versus a year ago. My next competition here, Ruta Maya, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, is growing at 2.1%. So even though Ruta Maya is much big, much bigger business, they're doing 5 million versus 1 million, about 2 million here. Collectivo is moving much faster. It's growing much faster. So that's a compelling story for Collectivo to tell of why get more shelf space. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that answers a question that you had, Gail, of, you know, if we're smaller guys and we're not in all these stores, how can we show that, you know, we're growing? The Nielsen report just kind of takes you and compares it to yourself. So exactly what Jordan was saying, if Rutamaya is growing at, you know, 2.1%, you know, you're comparing against stores that Ruta Maya is in versus, you know, comparing it against a much larger player. Awesome. So if we go back home here, the last thing I'll leave you with is our data on demand. So I know I walked you through a couple of the My Reports. I walked you through stories, which builds you a full deck. The My Reports are the preset reports Nielsen's built by understanding what are the reports retailers want to see? And then also what are the reports that brands are and manufacturers are building and running on a weekly basis? So pre-making those. So some of our smaller teams at more emerging brands are able to easily run them, even if they are a team of one wearing multiple hats. Um, And then the last thing I'll walk you through quickly is going to be our data on demand. So within data on demand, is where you can get really, really granular. You can choose exactly the category, subcategory, how detailed you'd want you want to get in the product section. You can choose specific brands you want to compare yourself with. Um, Pull in your specific markets that you want to see, whether that's markets you're currently in or markets you're wanting to get into. You can look at specific time periods. So maybe 4th of July is really big for you. Or I know I saw a pot pie brand in the chat. My guess is as we're getting into fall, winter, pot pie sales are probably going to start peaking. So pulling some of those colder months when you're wanting to build your retailer story there. Um, Maybe you're trying to get an end cap, for example, for those winter months pulling those colder times so you can show how sales will increase with that. 
uh, pull the metrics you want, and then build your layout. So if you want to use our pre-made reports or our stories, by all means, they are there for you. But if you do have more specific, more granular questions that apply really to only the nitty gritty of your brand, you do have the availability to get really granular within the data on demand tool. Again, pre-visor, this is something that was only available to those larger brands. And you can imagine if you have all of this at your fingertips and one brand is bringing in this data and the other one is just bringing their passion, whereas the other one has the data and the passion, I think it's pretty clear that the one that tells the data story is always going to win at retail. So building this visor platform has been a huge game changer for our emerging brands trying to get their foot in the door, trying to win some of that shelf space. Um, so it's been really cool to watch it, watch it play out and watch some of our emerging brands start to grow. So any last questions? Otherwise, I know we have a number of questions that we've gotten past that we can start to that we can talk through because I do find if one person has a question, probably every question. Yeah, feel free to pour all the questions in the chat. Uh, click the drop down button so that everyone can see it so we can get some, you know, people uh, to feel encouraged and, you know, you're not alone. Data can be scary, but we're here to make it easy. And while you, while you think of some questions, I will screen share the code here so that you can scan it and then start to get your, and then get your free, your three free reports. Um, and I would recommend jumping on this sooner rather than later, because if you are going to ask by West, you have that coming up, you can start to figure out what the data poll is that you want, that you want to see, um, work with your Nielsen rep to be sure that you're getting the information you need there. Um, Nielsen also will be at Expo West. We're really excited to be hosting the innovation booth. Uh, so please stop by, say hello. I unfortunately will not be there, but tons of my teammates will be. So if you have any additional questions, reach out to them as well. Um, let's see, Jeff, I see your question on, does it count as the free report, three reports for different time periods? What you could do is combine a few time periods into one report. Um, that's kind of a, a workaround there to get the most out of your poll. And again, your Nielsen rep can really work work with you to figure out what the how to most strategically use your poll so that none of them go to waste. Which again, if you scan, if you just scan that barcode there or click the link that Aless just put into the chat, you'll be set up with with a Nielsen rep who can help you figure out the best way to use your polls. Any other questions or any other thoughts? Is there anything, again, nothing is too small or too big that you were hoping would be covered in this presentation that wasn't? We can, we can either answer now or follow up with it. Yeah, I think Hannah put um, a specific question about like how much is a subscription? Is it aggregated or scan data? I would prefer to the one on one because um, I'm sure it's different for everyone, you know, smaller players versus bigger players. Um, so I think Alice just put the one on one uh, meeting. So I think that would be a good place to start. Definitely. Yeah, so the way Visor is actually priced out is based on largely on two things. The whole idea of Visor is really to, to democratize data so that the smallest brand with the smallest budgets can ideally afford it. And then as you get bigger, that investment goes up. So the amount of data you're getting is going to be one of the cost drivers. So how many polls are you needing? How many categories do you need access to? And then size of company is another one. So again, we really work to make sure that our emerging brands are able to get into the platform. And then as you grow, Pfizer grows with you. So those are going to be the 
the two driving factors. There are a couple more things that go into the algorithm, uh, but cost does vary. So based on what you're getting, so definitely reach out um, to your Nielsen rep to figure out what that would be for your specific brand. Um, see, yeah, and Barb's question. question of, let's say you're completely new, what are some compelling data points to point out to a buyer if you don't have specific brand data? Jordan, I know you're talking about a category review earlier. Is there anything else you would recommend? Yes. So looking at that category review and then pulling out what's special to you first the category. So let's say, for example, you're a sustainable brand. Uh, and for a quick introduction, I manage the beverage vertical at Nielsen. So I know the ins and outs of everything emerging beverage. And right now, if a beverage brand is recyclable, it's growing 14% faster than its non-recyclable global counterparts. So pulling out statistics like that to say, hey, look, we, we are recyclable. Uh, I know that brands who fall into this category are growing faster. I see that you have a number of brands who don't fit this mold. And I looked into the panel data. They have the same shopper. They don't have a loyal consumer base. We know that we do. Um, so telling that story of where you fit on shelf based on what's specific to you. Again, finding that thing that makes your brand different, what makes you passionate about it, and then building the data story behind it. My guess is that if you feel, if you saw a need to make the product you have, chances are there's a gap in the category for it. And it's your job to then find, it's your job with Nielsen to then find those, find those gaps, find the white space tell the data story of why the retailer needs that product, where you can fit on shelf. That's amazing. I really love the idea of like taking your own personal passions because we all started brands for a reason, right? We saw a gap in the market and trying to create a story that, you know, backs up that passion. So it's nothing that you haven't been doing already. Yeah, it's really just putting the data behind behind your story, behind your passion, behind your why. Um, it all comes back to how are you going to make the retailer money? And it does take both of those things. It takes your why, your story, and then backing it with the data that will prove out is really the it's really the bow on top of the package of your product of why you should be on shelf. Really good question. Well, if there's nothing else, or if you're like me and you think of a question as soon as a call ends, we can, let's see, I think my email right might be right up here. If not, let me put it, let me put it here now so that you can reach out. It's just Jordan. Uh, more. Q.com. You can reach out directly to me. Again, scan the questions in the Q&A. Great question. What would kombucha be categorized under? So kombucha, I actually will have to check on this one. So let me take this one and follow up with you. I believe we have a kombucha category. Um, so let me follow up with that with you on that one to confirm. And, and then, then Elizabeth, your data drop a. Eh? <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, sorry, go ahead, Jordan. You were saying something. No worries. Great point. Um, next for the templates to choose from, can you personalize them with your personal style? Great question, Elizabeth. Uh, you can export each one into PowerPoint and that's where you can color code, make and really add in your personal style and touch. Um, if you're talking about more of a cosmetic view. And then if you're talking about personal style, as far as how you want to see the data, you can customize those three attributes, like the product, the time period and the market. But if you wanted to get a little bit more customized into things like flavor, sustainability, um, ingredient level, that's where you'd go into that data on demand. All right, we um, have one it, more question. 
before we wrap up. And I think you're just about to read it. Is it confidential? Once you input it into the site, can anyone see it? So once your data is in Nielsen, anyone can see it. The kind of caveat I'll give there or, or point I'll make is that at the end of the day, almost every item selling does end up in Nielsen scan data. So whether you're sending it in or your competition sending it in or it hits that sales threshold where we're, we automatically pick it up, it's going to be put into the system. So Megan, that's a great question because it really goes back to if you're not telling your story, somebody else is. So getting your items in there, you understanding your data, being able to speak to your data, how you're doing versus category, what makes you special, um, how your loyalty is. If you're not speaking to that to your buyer, chances are your competition is speaking to your buyer about it. So just another reason, especially for emerging brands, why it's so important to jump on the data train now rather than later. Because yes, you don't be shy. Exactly. All right. So we are at time. Thank you so much, Jordan, for taking an hour out of your day. Thank you, everyone, for taking an hour out of your day to listen to data and how much we love data. Um, you have her email. Um, you have me on Slack. Join the Slack if you haven't. Um, but thank you so much. And I hope this is the beginning of your data journey. Yes, thanks. I'm looking forward to hearing from each of you. Thank you. Bye-bye.